But in middle school, something happened. I'm a happy, go-lucky kid, mom and dad both at home. My teacher, she said, Pete Key, go to the front of the class and read Shakespeare. I said, you're the teacher, you go to the front of the class and read Shakespeare. Everyone started laughing. I go to the office, principal is like, hey, don't worry about her big guy. You ready for the game today? Cause I was a star basketball player. At least I thought I was, right? I get home from school that day. My mom like, hey, I need to talk to you and your brothers. I'm like, okay. I'm like, man, I know the school. I'm thinking the school didn't call, right? And she said, no, uh, your father left this morning. We're getting a divorce. He's on drugs really, really bad. And he told me to tell you all about My name is Pete Key, and this is my broken but not dead story. I'm broken, not dead. I go back to school the next day, and this teacher by the name of Miss Amy Stocker, she said, B. Key, what is this about you cannot read? You're one of my brightest students. You know the Battle of Shallow. You know the Civil War. You know, uh, how is it you can make A's in my class and C's and D's? And I said, Miss Stocker, this is the way you teach. Miss Stocker, you make it. And she looked me in the eye, and she said, if you can remember whatever you hear, but you cannot read, you have a gift. She showed me how to take a cassette player and press record, and I would look at the word and I would read and record myself. And if I heard it, I could remember it. That's how I made it through school. A lot of people don't even know that's how I made it through school. So now, instead of me continuing my education in college, I said, you know what, I'm tired of this, I'm dropping out. I didn't know how to handle discipline. And I found myself in Atlanta, Georgia, Man, pass me a beer, man. Give me that, you know. The thing that I said I would never do. I wanted to be a rapper. That was my thing. You know, hanging out with Goody Mob and Outkast. This is a long time ago. And but a year or so later, I said, man, this high school queen who had been with me on and off, I think it's time to settle down. And I popped the question. And we get married. And everything is going great. And six months into the marriage, I allowed a guy to use my vehicle on the job that I was working. And I didn't know that he had stolen about $20,000 worth of golf clubs and put it in my car on the premises where we worked. So they came and get me and said, hey, what is this stuff doing in your car? I'm like, man, what are you, I didn't put this in there. And they knew he had gotten it. But because I worked at the place and I was over a certain department, they thought that it was a, like a ring, you know. And he walked me through the plan. And go. I'm like, whoa. I mean, drugs, alcohol, all of this, but jail? So the next day I get a, I get my phone call, I call my wife, hey. She picks me up the next, I think it's maybe been that Tuesday or Wednesday of that next week. And we're leaving. And man, just silence, you know, I'm just like, I said, what do we do next? And my wife looked me in the eye and she said, at least we know what not to do next time. And it's New Year's Eve of the next year. And this is when the change took place. She wanted to go to church for New Year's Eve. I was like, okay, we can go to church. She said, started at 8.30, 9 o'clock that night. I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. We can do that. We get to the church. It's so crowded. People everywhere. I'm like, why are they doing that? What? It's too, I mean, it's, okay, well, what time does it end? And she's like, well, about 12.30 or 1. But hold on, what, what do you mean? Like 8.30, 9 o'clock, New Year's Eve? And we're going to be in church until 1, into the... I said, I didn't sign up, but I'm thinking like, it's going to be like 8 to 9 or 9 to 10. I'm not thinking like, I said, no, I can't. I will leave you here. I can go home. If you want to stay at church, you can stay at church. I'm not. And man, my wife was so mad. She said, okay, let's just go home. She get in the car. I'm driving home. 
get home. We had a nice, beautiful home. She goes upstairs. I go downstairs. You know, I had my little Hennessy. I had my little stash. And uh, I'm like, it's New Year's Eve. Hey, she's upstairs. She's mad. The only reason I stopped drinking and smoking was because of her anyway. So if she's mad, then why not do it anyway, right? And so here I am. watching them flipping the TV, right? You're not flipping. This guy pops on the TV. He said, consider your ways. You in that house? You all alone? I'm like, oh my God, I changed the channel. Up. Man, I'm looking around like, okay, I know I'm high, but... And so, I changed it back to the channel. And all of a sudden, he said, I'm talking to you. You and your wife are going through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, really, literally, I'm like, okay, you talking to me? And I was like, I, I really, you know, and, and you got to understand, one of my rap songs was Mr. Preacher Man Trying to Get Your Money. That's that's the type of rap I was, right? So you talking about a, 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 a televangelist got me looking at the screen like this. Yes, sir. God, what do you want to do with my life? I mean, it was so. And so I go upstairs. I tell my wife, I say, hey, um. I just seen this dude and like, I just felt like he was talking to me and like, like, and he said that God like has a plan for my life. And and like, I, I looked him up when, when the broadcast went off and his church is in Atlanta. And so I want to go to church. Let's go to church. And this is like still that Saturday night. And so the next Sunday we go to the church and he's preaching a message entitled, your vision is too small. Again, I have another one of those moments. He said, I don't know who I'm talking to, but you're trying to get a record deal right now. You're, you're, you're a musician, you do music. I don't know if you're a rapper or a singer. At the time, I had a CD. It was called Each One Teach One. It had a spirit side, it had a flesh side. It was hip hop, it was, it, it, it was like, it was so twisted, you know what I mean? It was like, if you knew, you would be looking like, man, this is crazy, I man. Are you serving God, I mean, you know? And I felt like he was talking to me. And he said, your vision is too small. You're a business owner. You're gonna run a record label one day. You're gonna change the world. You're gonna, I mean, he just, and, and, and he said, if I'm talking to you, stand up. And I stood up. Now, I, I've forgotten that my wife, her friend, they look, you know, you know, cause you know, sometimes you, and I'm just looking. And he said that God has a plan. Before you know it, I walked to the front. I rededicated my life to Christ. Because I got, you know, I went to church when I was a kid. And man, I started this journey from that New Year's Eve, that night, to this day. I never had another drink. I never smoked weed again. I, I mean, it, like when I tell you I didn't go through a 12-step program, it was like I, I realized at that moment that purpose, like I really had a purpose for living. Didn't know what it was. I just knew God, he said God had a plan, you know, and, and I, I, I knew one scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, <laughs> I know the thoughts and plans for you. I said, well, God had a plan, a destiny, a hope for me, and that's all I knew. And Dr. Miles Monroe had this statement that says, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but living life without purpose. And that's when I realized that the rapping thing was more than rapping. That there was purpose to it. August the 6th, never forget, I just come from doing a youth conference. My mom dies. And all I kept thinking about was, she kept saying, one day, one day I'm going to do this. One day I'm going to do that. One day I'm going to go here. One day. And I started thinking, man, I do not want to live my life saying, one day, one day, one day. So a year later, and I asked for a leave of absence, and they said, no, nah, either you show up to work, you, 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 you resign, or we're going to fire you. serious? And then boom. I said, okay. I tell my wife, I said, hey, we 
I don't speak, we don't eat. Let's launch. And we launched. I sent him my resignation letter. And there it was. October, I mean August. Within two or three months, I had tripled my income with grants and speaking engagements. And we took off. We were walking through one day, going to Longhorn Steakhouse. This old man was on a walker. He's coming out. I got my wife, my two daughters. We're trying to walk in, and he's on the walker, so I keep, I hold the door open. So he's on the walker, he comes. And so when he gets out of the restaurant, he leans up against the door. I said, oh, I, said, I got it. He said, oh, I got it. And then here come this lady on the walker. I said, Miss Stalker. She said, PK, is that you? She said, I've been here some good time. I said, Miss Stalker. Miss Stalker, you, you changed my life, Miss Stalker. This is the teacher. I was like, you know, Miss Stalker, I've been on Steve Harvey. I've been with Les Brown. I've been to Africa. I've been to Europe. I've spoken to me. Miss Stalker, I've written a book. Miss Stalker said, Pete Key, have you written a book? There is a God. <laughs> I mean, she just, I hugged her. Miss Stalker was like, I said, Miss Stalker, you changed. She said, Pete, if I had known it was affecting you like that, I would have done more. I was just doing my job. And there was a statement made in that moment. That someone's destiny is tied to your assignment. I'm doing this presentation one day. While I'm doing this presentation, I'm in the middle of the presentation. I come out, I got on a suit underneath. I got on an orange prison suit on top of that. I got on a football jersey on top of that. Basketball shorts, bandana, hat, binoculars. I'm walking out. I come out, I come out into this school. There's about 600 uh, uh, students in this gymnasium. I come out and I do this skit, and that's what I should do, music, drama, and motivation. So I'm in this skit, in the middle of the presentation. I say, never ever make a permanent decision based on a temporary problem. Suicide is never the answer. Doing, I mean, I'm, I'm like, and boy, I could just feel, I could feel this. I mean, it was just one of those moments. I finished the presentation this tall, Blonde girl comes up. You changed my life. Oh, that was so good. You changed my life. Oh, that was so good. I want to live. I mean, they apologize. She, and she's just going on. And then she held me so tight. And I don't know, you know, like she's holding me really tight and it's getting really uncomfortable, right? And so I'm looking at my wife like, hey, get her. Like she's looking that way. I'm looking like, get her. And finally, my wife comes and hugs her. And the counselor comes up and says, you don't know what you did for her today. I said, well, what? She said, well, she said, she tried to commit suicide 31 days ago. And while she was in the place, she'd been there for 30 days. Her dad came and told her, I wish you had succeeded with the suicide and put her out the house. I said, oh my God. She said, today was her first day back to school. So I went back looking for it. I'm like, I'm like where did she go? Are you know, I went to home. So, so, I'm, so I'm looking at him like, hey, what? You, you, I heard what happened. I mean, what? You, you okay? I mean, what, what, what happened? What was it? What did you? What did you get? She's like, oh, you changed my life. And they apologized. The people were bullying Tim, and they apologized. And I said, but, but what did you get out of it? She said, oh, the, the energy, the excitement. You, I said, but what did you get? You got to tell me. What did you? I got to do every school in this county. What did you get? And she looked me in my eyes. And she said, you gave me hope. I said, hope? She said, you gave me hope. When I came to school today, I was going to succeed with the suicide. T today was my first day being here and not being surrounded by people, not being monitored. But at that moment, I started thinking, I wouldn't have been in that school if Miss Stockett hadn't have been that teacher who said, you have a gift. I wouldn't have been in that school if she hadn't have said, you have a gift to remember whatever you hear, even though you cannot read. All of the things that have happened on that journey, I realized it wasn't even about me. That someone's destiny was tied to my assignment of even going into the schools. And once I realized that, I'm like, man, this is... And I start going from school to school. Before you know it, I'm in Europe, I'm in 
Africa. And I, mean, I remember being in Africa and I'm getting ready to leave. It's the last day. I've been there 30 days. I'm tired and I go to this last school. I finish the presentation. This guy comes up to me. I want to be one of your hope dealers in Africa. I said, excuse me? He said, I want to become one of your hope dealers in Africa. I said, hope dealer? He said, yes, make me a hope dealer now. This is the only thing between me and a 20 hour flight back to the States. I look around, he wasn't gonna move. I said, raise your right hand. <laughs> I'm about to make you a hope dealer, man. I mean, it was weird. I said, I will give hope, I will live hope. Hope stands for helping other people excel, having only positive expectations. I mean, I'm just going to town with it, right? And man, in that moment, he said, when you get back to the States, you're gonna be the number one hope dealer. Cause I told him, I said, do you realize the hope dealer sounds a whole lot like dope dealer? And in the States, when you say dope dealer, like that's not a, he said, but you are a hope dealer. You brought us hope. And I realized at that moment, that at the end of everything that we do, at the end of everything that I say, I want to bring people hope. I want to give people hope. <sighs> it's funny, I heard this guy say this. He said that there are people who've done less than we've done in their day. There are people who drunk one beer and got drunk and had a wreck and died and I've drunk myself under the table. There are people who haven't done drugs and I've smoked weed and did all kind of crazy drugs and I'm still here and they're not. And he made a statement and I'll never forget. He said, the only reason you're not dead is because your assignment was greater than your sin. Yeah.